I'm Dev. And I'm Ari. And we are Dev and Ari. Ari. That's what we, we, we always do that at the beginning of everything. So uh, we're developing this game, Newt 1, which is a totally nonviolent 3D platformer. Uh, the format of this particular talk, we're not fully sure how it's going to work yet. The main idea is that uh, we're going to come in here. If you're interested, that's our website, our Facebook, our Twitter. And we're starting to adopt this hashtag of color me happy because the concept is th to make things more colorful and more happy. And we're going to start out with an intro and a demo, which is kind of what we're doing now. And then we're going to go through the, the next five bullet points, art direction, platform controller support, level design, the level music system, project evolution and management, and then time permitting uh, some Q&A. But we don't know in what order these are going to come up. I wrote a little web app that's just going to kind of go through and tell us what we're going to do and show. Oh my gosh, this resolution is okay. murdering me. No. <laughs> yeah, thank you for the vote of confidence there. But like, there there, yeah, it's just, I don't, whatever. So we don't know in what order those are going to come up. Uh, if I refresh the page and do this again, it'll be a different order. So each time we're, we're going to kind of just play this by ear and see what comes up <laughs> and how they actually do come up. Uh, so first and foremost, uh, Newt is a nonviolent 3D platformer. That's us from Minibar last year. And I had actually just moved back like a week before Minibar happened last year. And through some friends got it into the arcade. So you're seeing like a totally different version than you did uh, last year. And um, let's see, what do we want to say about it? Uh, one of the main reasons that we're making it is that we think that the world is a pretty divisive place right now. And games in particular, uh, they're, they've, they're pu the public face of games has uh, kind of switched over from being this fun place where uh, fanciful, fanciful? I don't think I've ever said that word before. Fanciful. Yeah, uh, like a fantasy plumber like playfully jumps on turtles, which is still murder, honestly. Um, at the very least, like uh, virtual animal cruelty and has turned into more of like the uh, murder simulators. Like that's what, that's what we see when you tell someone you're a gamer, the first thing they think of is that you play a, a bunch of Call of Duty uh, for the general person who's not involved in games. and. and uh, that uh, modeling that type of, of behavior is not something that we wanted to try and continue, but we wanted to be creative with games. I'm supposed to pass this mic every time we talk about something. I, is, I'm not sure if it's working. They can hear it. Well, well, yeah, but it's for the camera. Oh, okay, I see. So, so I'm going to ask Ari to take that, talk about why he's making the game, and then uh, we'll do a quick demo of a single level and then I'm, I'm making the game because you asked me that you wanted to make a game. <laughs> two, two years ago, my, actually, my, my background is more in um, art and animation. And, we should uh, probably say what we do. Yes. Uh, I currently work as a 3D modeler over at Axonom in Eden Prairie. And uh, Dev is a? I'm a director of uh, instruction in the full stack development program at Prime Digital Academy. All right. And uh, two years ago, on, on January, we actually went to grad school together, and we worked uh, teaching at Brown College uh, game design. And uh, that was like seven years ago. And then him and his wife moved to California. And when they moved, uh, he asked me in 2015, hey, do you want to make a game? And I was like, well, yeah, let's do it. Um, and the, sa the same reason, we, we wanted to create something that would be fun, would be family oriented, definitely that wouldn't bring violence into or create another product that has more violence into the game. Little did we know two, year, two years ago that a game like this would have a bit of a bigger impact nowadays where everything seems to just be in, been escalated more into more divisiveness. So it's been an amazing two years. We are very, very close to completion of the game. And uh, the people who have played it, they seem to react very positively, uh, positive about uh, the game. And that's something that it's very rewarding for both of us. So let's get us started. So we've got uh, a demo level that we're just going to run through. Is that too loud? No, no I think that's it's fine. good. Um, so Dev is going to do one of our uh, demos, uh, one of the levels that we have. All the in-game content has been completed. Uh, we have four uh, worlds. This is uh, an island's uh, world. We introduce the use of lava, so you don't want to touch it or go near it. Uh, Dev, at this point, is using uh, the wand. This magical wand allows you to colorize multiple things at the same time, making it easier for you to bring color and life back into the world. Um, the story of the game is that uh, there are these two characters, Newt, the main character, and uh, her friend, Kurno, more of a psychic. 
uh, they wake up and the entire world has been uh, lost its color and music. So it's up to them to find out what happened um, throughout through waking up the, the, the environment and the world. Uh, when we first started making the game two years ago, we had this idea followed by uh, like Mario Brothers and many other platformers where you would have enemies, you can jump on their heads, and then they kind of disappear, meaning you kill them. Um, we, we tried doing this, and the very first time we killed a character, uh, we feel so bad in our game. Like, terrible, terrible. We're just like, yeah, this is not a game we want to make. So we removed the killing of characters, and now these uh, characters that are around us that are asleep, uh, once you touch them like this owl, uh, they wake up and later they actually help you uh, navigate through the world. Um, we have picked up a power up, which is called the wings. These wings allow you to uh, navigate and jump to farther away areas. Um, the point of the game, it's to wake up the, the world, but at the same time, players are free to explore the realm. Uh, we created this uh, mechanic called a disruptor. There's no music. There's no color. Um, these disruptors, what they do is just they, they remove all the color and all the music uh, in the world until you touch them. Uh, at that point, you are able to use your powers again. Uh, jumping on water without protection uh, just makes you respawn uh, back again on your previous uh, location. Um, lava obviously is dangerous. And we have hidden uh, parrots. These little parrots are stranded in the world. There's always one of them stranded and these are just like the hidden secrets that you can wake up. Once you rescue one of these parrots, they become your friend and they fly with you so they don't get lost again. Let's see, oh nice. We have uh, different mechanics to keep the gameplay uh, going and fresh. We have rotators that allows us to create this kind of effect on platforms. Um, we removed a very important element of gameplay design, especially in platformers, the punishment of falling or dying. If you fall, you simply spawn back again and you're all good to go. There's no, no problem. You don't have that stress of, oh no, I have one, only one life and if I lose that life, I'm gonna have to start all over again. Nope, just keep playing, keep enjoying the game, uh, explore, uh, help out the world. <gasps> I don't have to worry, it's okay. It's okay, <laughs> we're good, yeah. <laughs> we're, we're, we're good. Um, in this particular world, we created this uh, element called the flippers and they just kind of flip um, the ground in a particular direction. So you just kind of have to time your jumps a little bit. Um, I'm not sure if you noticed, when we started playing the game, everything, including the background, was just very dark, very uh, obscure, and there was almost no music or sound. Now that a dev has awoken the world up to 91%, uh, you can see there's a lot, a lot of color um, all over the place. There's even more music now in the background. Um, we have a count on notes. Uh, right now we've collected 35. If you collect 50 of those notes, you can create a, a, a different color for your character. All right. Well, that's the gameplay mechanics. So let's see what we're going to talk about first. Let's see what we're going to do. Oh, Project wow. Revolution and Management. Sweet. One of the last ones. Nice. Uh, so I, this is all on GitHub. We will uh, share the GitHub repo with you a little bit later. Uh, one of the main things about this project was that we had an idea of what we were going to do when we started. And uh, kind, of, kind of contrary to what I was doing at the time, which I was a project manager at the time, um, we wanted to make a ton of space to allow emergent features to come out in, during the design process, which is kind of scary as someone who usually adheres to Scrum and likes burn down charts. So uh, what we started doing very early on was just um, building the basic tools and making the verbs for the player as simple as possible. Because we started with these really long levels and a lot of like easy, medium, hard mode, and uh, just way too many things that you could do. 
Uh, and what we discovered was uh, something as simple as a platform mover. We were like, okay, well, you got movers now, Ari. And then we started allowing him to just explore what he can do in the levels. So he'd be like, oh, well, now that I've got one or two movers, I can do that. Oh, that should say evolved. Yeah. Those evolved into platform oh. movers. Then we've got multiple movers that are going in multiple different levels. And uh, so then um, what actually started driving the feature set of the game was really his uh, curiosity once he started uh, developing a new level. He'd be like, I, can I get flippers? Can you make things that flip? And he'd be like, oh, I'd, yeah. And then we would just add that. And, and uh, part of what we were trying to do with the game was have it be kind of as helpful to us. And, and um, we wanted to be able to experience the game in kind of an exploratory sense and not just like we're trying to check off the check boxes to get the game done. The original game design was really generic. It actually, you can see here, we're con collecting coins instead of notes. Mm -hmm. And we thought one of the coolest things about it was it was going to go from 2D to 3D, like 3D to 2.5D side scroller. And it was just a stupid game. It was just a dumb game. But that was the original plan. If we stuck it to the plan, it would be. A, yeah. Well, I'm you can. We, to 3D to 2D yeah, it was a stupid idea. You can call my idea stupid. It's cool. Um, and so uh, then the idea was we will have 30 coins per level. And then that didn't really make any sense. So those became notes. And originally, those notes would give you, 50 notes would give you an extra life. You can see up here, we don't even have this UI anymore. But the, the lives go from 10. When you get to 50, they go from 9 to 10. Uh, then uh, uh, at Minibar last year, we actually got asked, why do, you have, why do you even have lives? And I had no answer other than, well, that's what games do, which is just a really stupid answer. Um, full of bad ideas. And uh, then at TEDx Mini in last August, uh, we also had like hundreds of people play it. And what we observed was people would, enjoy, would love the game, they'd enjoy it, and as soon as they died their last death, rather than even making them restart the game, we just restarted the level, just at the beginning of the level, instead of the last checkpoint. And they'd immediately go, oh, I loved it, that was great. And just put the controller back down and just take a step back and, and want to talk about it rather than continue to experience it. So we started working with the concept of that would give you an outfit upgrade. So now. Uh, you get like just a new set of clothes to wear when that happens. We looked at the disruptors. So this actually started as um, we were kind of feeling stale. We wanted each uh, one of the worlds, there's four realms, we'll talk about this when we get to art direction, to have something different in them, and, uh, but I have six levels each. And six levels started feeling kind of the same. And I was talking to my wife about, uh, my wife's name is Crystal, so she came up with this kind of idea of a disruptor that would just like make you not allowed to use your powers, as you saw. So it actually started out as a crystal. And then we had a Slack conversation about it, and then um, in, in which we, like, we were just like, hey, I think this looks kind of cool. That looks kind of cool. And then like later that day, uh, I had this pretty much working. And Ari was just like, well, I've got a model. And then we just started juicing it. And then I added the bubble. And then originally. Yeah, and then we have a disruptor, and it's now, uh, it, we had to do, there, there was more emergent stuff we had to do with it, like enabling multiple disruptors in the same level actually took like a week because they were so uh, duct taped together. We added the bubble, and then there are, there actually still are leaderboards up somewhere. Uh, actually, this might actually work if I open this up. Let's see what happens. Oh, no, that's from an old one, um, from, from an old uh, uh, URL. But we had leaderboards early on, and we just realized that's kind of competitive, and that's contrary to what it is that we're trying to do with the game. It didn't really make sense to have people like talking smack to each other about how well they're doing in a nonviolent game. So uh, we kind of moved that out. Uh, I think Ari talked about the enemies and NPCs. And um, I'm going to try to pull this together, because this is one of my favorites. And, and um, I cannot remember the gentleman's name. He's one of the art directors or creative directors at Ubisoft. He's got this concept of domains of play. And, and that's when you're um, dealing with assessing your game, you take a look at it in terms of, of two hours. It's like a radar grid. You've, and uh, he's got four domains of play. It's like fantasy versus realism, build versus explore. And the, the, in, the inner four squares are, does this exist at all in your game? And then the next uh, realm is, are, are you giving like 50%, do you give uh, an experience that's about 50% of what there is in the world? And the outer is like, I believe it's one of the best that we have to offer. So what we did a little bit late in the game, uh, and this was after we were starting to garner a, a good amount of feedback, so maybe a couple hundred people had played the game at this point. And if, if you do a, a YouTube search for Domains of Play, uh, GDC, the talk will come up from the 2014 GDC, uh, and you can watch, it's, it's a spectacular talk. It might have been 2015. Uh, so what we did was uh, we started rating the game in terms of like there's a little bit of realism in that it's not as 
um, abstract as something like Thumper or something like that. There, like there are trees and owls and like a floor and a sky and stuff. But it's definitely way more fantasy than realism. And th there's a little bit of building. You, you actually create things when you wake up the owls, you build something, but it's much more about exploring, but it's not Minecraft. You can just, we want you to explore the levels. You can talk about that a little bit later. It's definitely more, uh, more skilled than less skilled if anybody's played it. Like it's easy to see how platformers you fall off of stuff. There's no multiplayer, but we want it to be very calming. It's very much solo. There are a couple moments of thrill, like a, uh, one of our favorite things when we, when we show it at conferences is seeing someone, specifically at the conferences where people are wearing headphones, the first time they like walk up to a, a disruptor, they're like, what the heck is going on? And then they touch it and it like explodes, like, oh. Like there's, there's, there are still moments that we think, specifically when, once we expose the story that will come together. Uh, there is no PVP, but you do uh, cooperate with the other characters in the world. And it's much more about the content than it is the mechanics. So what this has allowed us to do is when, when we're receiving feedback from a lot of players, I can also ask, well, what types of games do you like? And, and how their like, player uh, profile and their um, preferences match up with uh, our audience that we're looking for in the actual games. So it's a bit of a UX perspective. This came a little bit later. Um, and for project management, we're, we're pretty much agile. Uh, everything has been broken down to a task or a ticket. We are using Git and Bitbucket. Uh, I, I created like a ticketing system called Overlord that we use that's really um, like a PHP uh, SQL thing. Uh, and we started out doing uh, bi-monthly builds, or is it bi-monthly or semi-monthly? Monthly. Well, it's, it is now, but it, before it was either semi-monthly or bi twi monthly every two weeks. We used to do every two weeks, and now we're, we're doing a build every month as we're, as once we've gotten over uh, beta 1.0. Okay, Did, have I missed anything? All right, let's keep moving. Ooh. All right, up next is... Oh, yes. level music system. Ari's excited because he doesn't have to talk. <laughs> All right, so for the level music system, um, what I really uh, did for the music is, it, and you'll see it in, in this next demo, maybe a little bit more than you did in the last one, is uh, there are six uh, general layers, which are like the, the melody, harmony, bass, accompaniment, percussion, and drums for every single uh, level. And based on the percentages and, and how far you are through the percentage, the, those loops um, Gets, uh, their volume gets changed. There's also a touch sound which is based on an arpeggio of the current chord cadence that's happening at any point in time, and a drone sound that, that walks through the, the basic, usually, usually triad, so sometimes a little bit more complex, sometimes I'll add like a seventh or a ninth, that'll go through the, the basic chords. And because the music is looping and there's a different music for each realm, I didn't want that to be repetitive like it is in most games, so what you get are a lot of key changes, a lot of odd time signatures, but I didn't want that to sound too completely um, like jarring as it can sometimes. So I'm going to do just a quick demo. Um, I've added a, a mode to one of these. Oh, clip is going to go here. I've added a mode to one of these levels that'll allow us to see the sound through the console. Also, if you're ever developing a game, adding your own console is like one of the greatest things you could ever do. This is the, the console that I, I believe it's show sound yes okay so what's happening here are these are the whew, don't walk too far this is uh, the drone it's kind of hard to see with the resolution of the screen but this is drone melody harmony bass percussion drums accompaniment and touch and you can see right now the drone this is like a power bar as you can think of that as or a volume meter so the, the VU meter is all the way up now as I touch items you'll see the touch uh, volume change and then as the level progresses, uh, and, and you'll also see the skies start to change, and the uh, stars and the clouds are going to start to change as well. But you, you'll be able to see the actual, um, you can see touch is kind of yeah. moving up. And I, moving I believe percussion is going to be the first to kind of creep in. A little bit of building there with these folks helping us out. So yeah, I can hear. Definitely hear the percussion now, a little bit of the accompaniment is coming uh, I, through. I see the next one, yeah. Oh, there's a bass. Ooh, a little, that, that was a lot of bass in that sound here. So you can see here the, the volumes are still as high as they can be for the disruptor. The disruptor is really uh, affecting the entire output of the whole sound system, not any individual channel. I also chose this level, well, really because it's one of my favorite levels to see what Ari can do with a level. It was a, uh, just a really 
interesting level here. Uh, but yeah, we can see we're still not getting any drums. That's the last one to come in because I believe it adds the most weight. But if you take There's a look, enough harmony to come in, yeah, yeah if, you can see a little bit better on this screen. You're starting to see the background change a little bit. Oh, I see, yeah. So one of the ways that uh, we're hoping to affect people's moods positively is through uh, not just the use of color itself, but also and music, but also a sense of progression. And uh, we've did some preliminary research, certainly not any research scientists, but uh, into how that has. Uh, had a positive impact on a lot of people's perception of their objective reality and, and specifically their subjective uh, sense of health and happiness. So another disruptor here and now we've got much higher, I think drums are still at zero, yeah. but we're definitely seeing a lot more sound come through. Okay. Another one of the things that uh, Dev has done with the music is uh, it starts very, the way I I think um, in a like a, a little more technical way of saying it is the the percentage to which each of these um, channels is affected by the um, the progression is actually randomized at the beginning of a level if that makes sense okay. so sometimes percussion percussion always comes in first drums always comes in last but it might be accompaniment that comes in before guitar the next time you play it because we've got the same same music for all six levels in each realm Okay, I'm gonna just get a little bit farther. So hopefully we can hear some drums because we're not quite oh, yeah, there. Right yeah, they're starting to come in, but, yeah. but hopefully you can see now how much the, uh, the world itself has actually changed. Oh God, Ari, I forgot this was in this level. Yeah. <laughs> That's, that'll be on the, like the back of the box. <laughs> Crap. This isn't even the hard one. The hard one of this is on the ice world, which is the exact same thing, but it's slippery. Yeah, I know. I felt the same way too. I was like, Ari, what the heck? All right, I think um, we're... Most of the levels on this, uh, we'll talk about the, the, the level design, but the levels start very calm, very soothing, and then just to give people the ability to have choice, we have some of the most difficult levels to work in the game. Okay, so that's the level music system. Up next, level design. Level design. Oh, look at that. And I'll take this guy. Thank you. Um, so I've been working, uh, or uh, I've been in charge of level design. And first, um, actually, like you can go to the next inspirations slide. Uh, the inspirations that I got for this, for creating the levels, uh, obviously was uh, Super Mario 64. Uh, some of the colors in Little Big Planet were amazing. Uh, the puzzle solving from Dual Hearts, Trine, um, and if anybody has played the Blob or the Blob 2, in this particular game, it's about a it's creature that walks around colorizing the entire world. That's all black and white. So we have borrowed elements from different genres and games to create what we have in Nut 1. And of course we have the mighty Sarape. Um, the Sarape has a lot of gradients, but um, I don't think we can see them right now. But if you've seen one of these uh, throws, the gradient is created by creating lines of color. So you basically have these lines, straight lines of color throughout uh, the, the cloth, uh, and that's what creates the gradient. Because we were going with a, a theme of music, I wanted to create, um, what do you call the, the, the music sheet? Staff. It's the staff of the music sheet that has the five lines and that's where the notes are. But I didn't want to make it that obvious for people to see it. So I went with the whole idea like, you know, the Sarapi has the lines and that allows me to do gradients, which then we can use on the background of the sky. So the process for level design is very simple. I start with just drawing where I want uh, people to go through. We use Unity to create uh, the paths. We test it out. 
and basically we just get feedback from play testers and we make adjustments to the levels. We have uh, four realms or worlds. The forest level, which or world, uh, it's the one that we have out outside. We have the entire forest world outside, and it's used to teach players how to navigate through the game. We have the ice world. Everything is very slippery. Um, the sky world, which uh, they've played on the last demo with the music. Everything is very nighttime, very jazzy. And we have the islands world, which they've played at the beginning of um, the demo. Uh, these are some of the color schemes and kind of designs that we used through um, the levels. Uh, we also have slides. I forgot that we have slides on that guy. And here's the forest. Um, for some of the ideas of level design, we've been approached mostly because in today's, most of, not most, but uh, a lot of the games that have come out today have this idea of open world, where players are free to explore and spend hundreds of hours with multiple side quests. Um, but you're free to, to explore and go anywhere you want. Um, we bear, when we were testing Newt 1 in the early stages, we were approached by testers saying, why don't you make Newt 1 a free to explore world? Uh, we were also approached by other testers that said, it should be more linear. You should tell your players, this is the start and here's the end. Uh, so in order to approach those two uh, <coughs> suggestions, we created both. We have a very linear path. This is one of the examples of one level. You start right here. You find the owls. You are able to navigate on a linear path. You spend some time on this circular um, area, waking up a few more owls that create the next path. You go a little bit in a circle, and you're done with the level. Um, to approach the idea of uh, free to explore, we also have more circular or more uh, open world levels, where we start right here, which is this part. You fall down. This is your free to explore area. From here, you're free to go around, wake up a few owls. Uh, if you picked up by now, our owls are our keys, are what helps people uh, solve puzzles and navigate through, through the world. Once you pick up some owls, this path gets open. You can go through those two areas, come back to the center, do more exploring, and then you finally come back. This is definitely not a linear pathway, but that way we are able to convey both needs for players to have a linear path and a more free to explore. Um, as we were talking about earlier, some of the mechanics that we added were very, very necessary, um, even though it's towards here on the uh, at the end. Uh, ramps. Ramps were created pretty much within the six months of us creating Newt 1. Uh, basically, I just went to Dev and I told them, Dev, I've been jumping all day. Can you make ramps? <laughs> Um, and he said, oh, I don't know, ramps are going to be tricky because look at whenever you go through a ramp, the shadow of new just goes through the ramp and then you flip the camera and the camera goes inside the ramp so now you can see below it. I don't know, I'll put two weeks on it, but if you want ramps, I was like, well, play with Adia and if it's too hard, I can jump, continue to jump for the rest of the, of the game. Uh, two days late. I think the first day um, he came back and said, we can walk on ramps. And on the second day, he's like, I fixed the camera problem so you don't go through the ramp anymore. So that's how we got ramps. Thanks to ramps, we are able to create the entire levels in the clouds world. The whole world in the clouds is just tilted. It's just one tilted world where everything is tilted and you're always, uh, there are a couple of places that are straight, but for the most part, everything is tilted, which brought us to the ability to parent objects to other objects. That's how we can attach this tree to this platform and add the platform on a bigger attachment and create a different experience for players. Uh, we created the idea of using jump pads to make people just reach higher places. Uh, we reduced a lot of our mechanics. Its lights and fans are exactly the same thing. They look completely different. On a slide, you just basically go down. On a fan, you jump on the fan and then just it carries you up. Uh, they've created a volume that once you go in, what the volume does, it just pushes players. So all we had to do is, oh, I'll push you diagonally, and then in this case, I'll push you up. Um, it just changes the way players perceive it. Uh, wobblers just basically make the floor move a little bit. Scale-outs, they just pop as you walk in, and then you get another platform. You walk in, and then you get another platform. 
Um, we have our disruptors and our movers that also we have already been seeing what they do. And I always, from year one, I wanted pendulums. I don't know why, I just wanted to have a pendulum in there. So finally, on islands, which this was the last world that we created, I asked Dev, I want to have pendulums. Can we do it? And he's like, sure. So we finally have pendulums, and we actually saw these guys on the first level that he played. Uh, we have flippers that just basically flip the ground. Thank to all, thanks to all of these abilities, we, our mechanics, we have been able to create 24 levels and make you jump and climb through ramps and not feel like you're doing the same thing 24 times in a row. Next. All right. We're almost there. Yes. For our direction, um, the way we created uh, some of the, I, sometimes people ask us like, so how do you, we know you're using Unity, which is the programming uh, uh, software that you use to make the game, but what other assets do you use? Um, I create everything, all the objects of the platforms, trees, characters, uh, in a program called Maya. Uh, what you do in Maya, basically, I start with a simple sketch. Uh, you spend some hours creating the model in Maya. Then uh, we basically unwrap this model into a flat version of the model. I don't know if you imagine the movie The Mask from a long time ago where Jim Carrey takes finally the mask out and it kind of flattens out the, that's the process of unwrapping. They basically flatten out the shape of a 3D object into a flat screen. And that's what the flat screen that we use to add color to create where the eyes are gonna be, where the body is going to be, where the colors for the thighs are gonna be and everything else that's gonna be on the, on the model. Uh, using this technique, we were able to uh, create different outfits. Uh, at the time, the need for outfits was not necessary, but we had a power-up called uh, Freeze, and we were using uh, Newt's hat to display the power-up, but it wasn't a very visible uh, thing for the players. So we decided to create different outfits and move the power-up over to something that's around her, so whenever she just freezes something, it just becomes a more visual cue for players to know, oh, I do have a power up. It's not that my hat just changed color. It's an actual tangible thing. Um, the first one, which is her main outfit, uh, has very vibrant colors um, that I borrow from a few other characters like uh, Orko from Masters of the Universe that has a very kind of darkish, bluish, uh, red colors and green colors. Uh, this is more of a combination of an African hat mixed with uh, Chinese, um, I don't know, what would you call this? Bloom? Hmm? Bloom. Yeah, bloom. Uh, and the front part is more of an Aztec uh, part of the hat, so it's a very ethnic cultural feel which goes into the island's uh, world. This is our snow uh, or ice or glacier theme uh, outfit. And this one right here is more of a, a evening dress that I'm going with a, I don't want to call it like a pimp hat that you would wear at night, but it's a bit of a, a pimp hat. Can I just say it very quickly, he didn't even tell me he was doing this stuff. Just one day he sent me this model. He's like, uh, here, this is the, this is the like winter model. I was like, what is this crap? I have to ho put a whole nother feature in and I opened it up. I was like, oh, that's freaking adorable. That's, I'm, I'm going to make that work. <laughs> Um, so that's basically how we became to have, and, and in the story of the game, that makes sense why she needs to change different, um, different outfits. Um, the art, I, I believe art, is art the, yeah. Um, the art for the, for the game was very, very clear to us after we started to play with the idea of having uh, four realms, a forest, an island, glaciers, and clouds. Um, as you can see, they, they all have a particular set of colors that are distinctive to that particular realm. Um, on the first one, which is the forest clouds, if you can scroll to the next. Um, these are the outfits, all the color changes for Newt one in the uh, forest. Um, the sky, we have our own staff. Uh, the bushes, I went with two particular styles, a warm color scheme and a cold color scheme. And this is how we can get away with repetition so people don't feel like they're looking at the same tree all the time. So by combining the same, uh, Imagine all the reds in the color scheme uh, on the color palette uh, being used as a warm and cool that allows you to get more variety. On the island's uh, colors, 
we're going for a more primary set color, like blue, yellow, and red are gonna be the main, the main colors, and then everybody else is gonna join in. Uh, almost feels like a party, like, uh, oh, I'm in Miami, I'm gonna go party with friends, if I have friends. Um, oh, on the next one we have uh, glaciers. Uh, glaciers has been kind of our, our on ongoing joke uh, of like, yeah, we have, we're gonna have four worlds, forest, um, clouds, and islands, and then this is gonna be called Minnesota? <laughs> Just gonna call it that way, and, but we decided to call it Glacier, so make it more international and for everyone to understand. Uh, we have very, uh, we, the idea is that everything is frozen, but I wanted to stay away from white because white just gets lost with everything around it. So we have this very soft blue that allows you to see at least where you're standing every time you fall versus just like, is that a platform or am I gonna fall? Um, everything is very cool and we also have a very warm color scheme to put on trees and plants and a cold color scheme to put on trees and plants to create that um, effect. Clouds, I always imagine clouds like you being at night at a jazz um, concert or um, I don't know, like a club. So it has very jazzy, very edgy, uh, jumping colors uh, at you. I think it's one of the most colorful uh, realms that we have. Again, following with a warm uh, set of colors and a cool set of colors for trees uh, to bring that variation. Uh, one of the main colors that persists throughout the entire game is yellow. Yellow is uh, neutral and it could be used pretty much anywhere and it combines with absolutely everything. Uh, yellow also makes us happy and it gives us a lot of energy even though we don't, we don't notice. So it's, it's kind of hidden in there but you always get this sense and bits of energy kind of pump into you like, be happy, be happy, here's yellow, be happy. So it, all of it, it kind of brings up with that feeling of like, oh, I'm kind of feeling relaxed and happy at the same time. All right. So we know what the last one's going to be. You've only got five. That's going to be platform, platform controllers. controllers. Um, this will be by far the most technical. So bear, bear with me a little bit. Um, so if anybody had gone to Martin's talk about Unity and um, uh, mobile device stuff, this is going to build a little bit on top of that. So uh, PC and Mac, Linux kind of is easy with Unity. You, you, build, the, you build the game, you, you uh, export the executable, and it works. Linux was an early target, but the, the video card support was so iffy that we were getting a lot of artifacting on, uh, on even just like the five or six on which my friends were testing. So I was like, we're going to wait for that a little bit. Uh, one of the questions that I get all the time is like, well, you say you're making your game in JavaScript. or I, I use JavaScript uh, for about 90% of this stuff. And people are like, I don't understand that, which makes sense. Um, because most people think of JavaScript as a way to develop for the web, which is kind of where it exists. So I wanted to do a very quick example of how um, I would use it here. Ooh, this seriously, I don't know if we're gonna what kind of screen. <laughs> that's the that's the amount of space we have with this resolution with which to work. Okay, so uh, we're not we don't have much real estate here with this uh, this UI. Oh, jeez, they literally cannot go any smaller than that. Okay. Well, we're going to make this work because we are survivors. So uh, what I'm going to do is just uh, I'm going to add a 3D object to this world. This is uh, Unity's uh, like IDE. It's pretty straightforward. Or the editor, I'm sorry. Uh, this is a scene view, which is like uh, it can be, right now it's kind of perspective, but it can be orthographic. So you can place things, move them around. And then there's a game view, which has like a little Pac-Man next to it. So I'm just going to put in a, a cube. And there's our little cube, and we can see here in the inspector, I've got its position, its rotation, its scale, so I, I can manipulate those pretty easily. I'm gonna set it back um, to the origin, and what I'm gonna do is just create a new JavaScript file, and I'm gonna call this the cube test, and open this up, and you'll see something that is pretty uh, similar to, it's gonna open mono develop. I usually do, uh, Usually when I'm working on our stuff, I'm working at home, and I actually use Atom, uh, Mono, and Visual Studio. I kind of go between all three of them just to keep myself, like every month or two, I just switch my IDE just to keep myself a little bit fresh. I know that sounds weird, 
but it's good. We use Atom uh, where I worked in the day. If you use like a, a particle photon or an Arduino or something, this might look familiar. You've got like your setup and your loop or your repeat. Uh, all I'm going to do here is I'm just going to listen um, for a key and rotate the cube. So uh, one of the built-ins that we'll, we'll get is, um, I believe it's camel case like that. So I'm going to check for the A key. And if the A key is down, I'm going to rotate the cube, which in this case, is the transform of the cube, which is its position, its rotation, and its scale. So I'm going to, and this is, I'm going to put this script on the cube. So I'm going to say transform. Um, I'm going to use Euler angles, if I spell correctly. I'm going to create a new variable called speed. That'll That'll be uh, global. I'm going to force that to be a float. So now I've got a floating point number called uh, speed. And if I, uh, if on update, if the A key is detected as being down, I'm going to add the value of speed to the Y rotation, which is the up uh, uh, value of the cube. So it's like X is, uh, X is to, the, uh, to the left, I believe. Z is towards you and Y is up. So if I hold the A key down, the, we should see the cube spinning. If I didn't have any syntax errors, which is very possible. So we'll see this. I don't know if you saw the, the icon there. It was thinking. So it was actually compiling the script. If I had any errors, it would tell me there. I did not have any errors. So now I've written this script. I have the cube. I just need to apply the script to the cube. You can just drag it on over. And now I can see that this cube test is a, a visible in my inspector. So now it's been added here. I've got a speed of zero. I'm going to create a speed of three. I'm going to hit play. We're going to have this little tiny view. And I hold down A, and it spins when I hit A. Does that make sense? So uh, if, you, if you've been uh, thinking about like, how can you use JavaScript to go from like, a RESTful API and, and, and like, integration to developing something for a game, this is probably the easiest way to put it. The way, the way that I like to explain uh, how update works is, Update runs every time the frame is refreshed. So it's like refreshing your browser. And if you're familiar with games, usually you're shooting for like 60 frames per second, 30 frames per second. Sometimes you get 24 frames per second, which says what about how often this update function is going to go. We don't have control over that. That's going to be based on the power of the system and the power of the computer. So uh, what one of the things is that Unity allows you to do is use this thing called delta time. And that's the amount of time that has happened since the last frame was rendered. So if I multiply my speed by the time the last frame was rendered, if it takes longer, it'll move. Uh, the, if there's a longer time between frames, it'll move faster. If there's a shorter time between frames, it'll move slower. So that should normalize that, um, that interaction. Just a very quick like primer. As a result, now I'm multiplying this by a fraction of a fraction of a second. I'm going to need this to be a lot higher. Oops, I did not mean to hit save. Did I set that to 300, though? That's the, that's the real question. Yes, I did. And so even though it's 300 now instead of 30, it seems like it's about the same speed. But now it will rotate at this speed, theoretically. On, on, um, it'll seem to rotate at this speed on a computer that's faster or a computer that is slower. So we can go in and just very simply start using um, some of our other JavaScript stuff. So instead of adding for D, I will subtract for D. So A and D should now rotate in two directions. So now I can go in two directions. Pretty straightforward. I just wanted to, to give a practical example of that. For some reason, that's like a, a leap that's very difficult to make uh, for a lot of people uh, conceptually. Don't save useless garbage. Um, same with you. All right. So. If we go back to here, now these are all of the, this is my desk at home. Uh, these are all of the currently supported um, controllers in the game. For each one of the verbs that we have in the game, it needs an individual binding. So in, the, in this case, that would have been rotate left and right. And so uh, that would, you could rotate that, you could add that to one of these sticks, right? Left and right. So, or to the mouse. You move the mouse left and right, or to two keys. So that would be an axis. So each of the verbs we've got, like move forward, back, move left, right turn left, right, uh, look up, down, zoom in, out, jump, glide, 
uh, charge burst, release burst. Uh, there's even even any verb that the user is going to have, like open menu, use menu button, go up and down through menu. Those all need to be bound to a specific key. Each one of those keys is different for each one of these controllers, and it is different on each one of the platforms. So even though there's an Xbox 360 wired controller here, and there's another Xbox, oh, it was on my, uh, must have been on my um, couch. But there's a different Xbox 360 wired controller. They actually have two different bindings, because this, was not, this one was not created by Microsoft. So you can imagine, for every verb, you need to multiply that by every platform, and then you need to multiply that by every controller. So very quickly, I'm, I'm coding thousands of potential interactions. And as a result, what I created was this, uh, this thing called uncle. So I created a, a, which stands for Unity Controller Library. And this, it, uh, you run this program, you, you map the keys to kind of a generic thing, and then it sends, uh, it creates, it takes the input from your session, it sniffs out what your um, controller is, and what platform you're on in your operating system, and it uploads that information to my database and then returns as an API uh, the J a JSON file of all this. This is all freely available if anybody wants to use it, just let me know. So um, that's a pain in the butt. So we kind of decided to go with the Xbox. Uh, we, we talked to them. This was the day that our Xbox development kit came up. And that has allowed us to really focus specifically on designing for one specific controller interface and one set of hardware. So currently, that is our main focus, our beta. This is the first time that it, I got it running on, a, um, on the Xbox One development kit. It has it's a very similar set of issues. Again, if anybody was at Martin's last talk, in that when you develop for the Xbox One in Unity, it actually exports a Visual Studio project. Then you have to build the Visual Studio project and put it onto your Xbox One. So you're a few steps away from actually working. That, that in and of itself takes a bit of time. For your developers, uh, all of the like nondescript JavaScript components that don't really have a type, none of those work when it gets into Visual Studio. So you have to redefine any of those. So the game was all working. It was working great. Had been working for a year and a half. And then I started building for Xbox One. 200 errors. I had to go through, refactor all the code to kind of make that stuff make sense. Some of that you can abstract. Just uh, in, you can keep it in C sharp and just abstract. Just create a function that you can send a message to that function. If you have questions about that, feel free to ask that too. I think we're about at time, so I'm going to just go ahead and say if there are any questions, great. Uh, yeah, the Steam Controller was a monster, actually. And I haven't actually touched it. I don't even know if it still works, honestly, because I had the, thanks for asking, because I hated, I hated working with the Steam Controller. Because uh, I tried to get the, like, the grippy things to work, and they never actually registered. So I'm, I'm just using like, it as if it's an Xbox controller. But yeah, um, thanks for asking, because that was like Unity 5.3, and we're at like 5.5 now. It was like a year ago. Yeah. Like stuff like that. Do you think Journey might be one of our influences? Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Like, absolutely. Like, Journey is one of our. Journey is actually. Uh, I I consider Journey the current answer for like is game art. Like I I feel comfortable giving Journey to anybody and having them play it and they will come out with that. He was so insistent that I play Journey because I was Xbox 360 in the last generation on PS4 now that he actually made me borrow his PS3 and Journey. Like, he just he delivered it to me one day. He was like, you're gonna take this and you're gonna enjoy it. And he was absolutely right. It was, it, it, yeah, one of the best. Um, I think we'll start there and just kind of scoop around. So does targeting Xbox specifically allow you to get away with doing less stuff like with the Deltas or, you know, um, abstract hardware optimization versus, like, specific hardware optimization? It would if, if we weren't also planning on releasing on Xbox, or Xbox on uh, PC and Mac. Like, one of the things where we're technically developing a universal Windows application. So when it releases on Xbox, it'll also release on Windows. So we, it, we could, if we wanted to be like a platform, if we were important enough and rich enough to be like a platform, you know, a killer app, then yeah, we could, but we're not. Uh, what sort of background did both of you have before you got into this? Um, um, I did um, film 3D animation in 3D models in the background, like b before, I guess. Uh, so we went to grad school together, and we both have MFAs in 3D animation. Uh, 
it's an MFA. So that was when I realized that I, my undergraduate's in comp sci. That was when I realized that like, I am not an artist, was when I was around, surrounded by people like him. So on this game, uh, like I do the high level game design and programming and sound, and he does all the art and level design. So um, we've, the fact that we've known each other now for like 13 years or something like that helps in, in terms of like, I'll forgive him when he tells me that my stuff sucks, and then I recognize that it's true, and he knows to be patient with me when I say, I can't do that. But um, yeah, my background was, it was really in kind of hard computers, and then, and then um, it was about 12 years ago that yeah. we were in grad school, and at that time, games weren't, they didn't look like they do now. Yeah. The PS2 era, I was still like, ah, pre-rendered is where it's at, Pixar is what I, what I want to do, mm -hmm. and then things really started coming together in about 2005 with the previous console generation. Is there, I think there was one more, yes. Yeah, did you, uh, did you guys have prior experience with uh, more violent games? Or so, non yeah. Non uh, so I've always tried to be nonviolent, and I actually worked on this, the 2010 Stargate video game and like was able to use enough cognitive dissonance to tell myself that that was, even though you're like people shooting people with machine guns, that it was people shooting aliens, and that wasn't really where I wanted to go. Um, and. One of the things we pride ourselves on with this game is it's one of the only games I can think of right now that rewards you for how much life you bring to the world, not how much life you take from it. And that in and of itself we think is like a different type of focus. Do you have any answer to that? The same. <laughs> cool. Uh, okay. Yeah, Joey. Yeah, so uh, and maybe I just want to understand this, but by having, uh, I think you said this is on GitHub, correct? Uh, it's on Bitbucket. It's, it's on Bitbucket, so it's uh, it's a private repo on Bitbucket. Like, okay. yeah, yeah. So my question was basically going to be around like, um, would there be any appetite you would have for like people to do mods, maybe even something as simple as changing the background song or something like that? Eventually, potentially. Huh? That was like a little rap. Uh, but the the I think the weirdest thing about that would be that the the sound system is so complex that doing something like that might might break it, and then people would think that it was a bug. Uh, there is some pretty low-hanging fruit in terms of like uh, maybe publishing those UV unwraps and having people make their own outfits or something eventually. Oh, that's kind of you know, because because that's why people like a lot of their games. This is also inherently a single-player game, so it's not like you're going to be running around with your outfit in someone else's world showing it off. So we're not really sure how that's going to fit in. This is also our first like kind of big release, but I think we're out of time. So w no, no. All right. Was there was it? Yeah. Yeah, the life system yeah. by far. That just completely. It. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. Yeah. There's, there's there's like there's no doubt, and just watching people, we were sure that we had a game that people enjoyed, uh, who who fit our player profile that we were looking at at the very least, and um, we got a lot of really good feedback, and we saw people love the game and just walk away from it, even just like rather than spawning here, they spawned there, and just feeling like you die. Actually, one of the biggest changes was when you die now and you respawn, it used to go. Boom, and that goes bling. You know, like just you just feel like, oh, I didn't die. I re I got another chance. Like just like working on that that small bit of feeling made a huge change in user experience. And uh, like, and honestly, like I hadn't had a, a deer in headlights moment like that in years. When when um, I was asked like, well, why do you even have lives? It's like, like yeah, uh, sense. yeah. I I have no idea. So. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Because I'm used to dying. That was really the answer, was I'm used to dying many, many, many times. OK, I think we'll, uh, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, who's your demographic for the game that you're trying to do? Um, we, right from the beginning, we wanted to do family, just pretty much anybody. And once we removed uh, the life system, I think we hit that, for sure. It became really like, OK, now everybody can play it. Uh, we've seen kids, uh, f uh, four, a five-year-old and a six-year-old that have been playing the game, and they could be stuck in one same level for 20 minutes. But the fact that they just keep trying again, and if you're just next to them, you're like, okay, let's let's do this, and they feel like, oh, I, c I can I can play this. Um, Martin's daughter played it, and uh, Martin I think came to get her, and she's like, no, daddy, I have to stay. I yeah. promised him that I was gonna save the world, and we're like. When, when did we put like a, the promise? Like, yeah. was that like, a, like we, I don't, we never put, I don't we put it in there. So she got in too, uh, and that's one of our biggest rewards, I think, to see the, the, the feedback that we got. So no, the, the uh, target audience is still there.
Can I add, add to that that um, one of the best bits of feedback we got from TEDx was that uh, there was a few people who were like, oh, I'd love for my spouse to play this game in front of my kid instead of, you know, all these violent games that they play. Even, like, racing games that have, like, big crashes, they were like, I would just rather have them playing this. And I think it's a little bit easier to uh, give the controller to, like, my nephew and watch him think that he's playing while I'm playing with this game than it is for other stuff. I think we got time for maybe one more. Thanks, uh, The control scheme... I have not even come close to figuring out a way to have like all of the potential, even though it sounds like not many verbs for a controller, it's almost every single uh, button on the controller. One of the other ones is, is um, change controls. Is like the, the default controls don't control like an FPS game, and then there's a button that just like very quickly moves it, changes it to strafe and move and look. And uh, just even every time I try to play a platformer on a mobile device, I can't seem to make it like have any uh, have any like weight and feel to it? Yeah. Okay. So if you got, if you want to know any more, like come find us. You know, we're easy to find online. I I don't know how late the arcade's gonna be open, but we will be over at the happy hour stuff. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.